Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our Back to Class series with Dr. Darren Hayes from the Seidenberg School of Computer Science and Information Systems. My name is Hannah Wiley and I'm from the class of 2023 and I'm majoring in business management with a minor in statistics. I'm a page student ambassador with the Office of Alumni Relations here. I just have a few housekeeping tips before we begin. Your microphone was muted upon entry and we ask that you remain muted during Dr. Hayes' presentation. And if you have any questions throughout, please enter them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen and we'll address as many as we can following the presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Darren Hayes. Dr. Hayes is a leading expert in the field of digital forensics, intelligence and cybersecurity. He is an associate professor at Pace University in New York. He has been listed as one of the top 10 computer forensic professors by forensics colleges. He has developed a computer forensic program at Pace, including the Digital Forensics Research Laboratory at Seidenberg School of Computer Science and Information Systems. He continually conducts research with his Pace students in support of law enforcement agencies, both domestically and internationally. Dr. Hayes was selected as a recipient of the 2020 Homeland Security Investigations New York Private Sector Partnership Award. As a forensics examiner, he has worked on numerous cases involving digital evidence in both civil and criminal investigations. He has also been declared an expert witness in the US federal court. Dr. Hayes is an accomplished author with numerous peer reviewed publications on computer forensics. A Practical Guide to Digital Forensic Investigations, second edition is the fourth book he published. Thank you. Great, uh, great to see everybody. Everybody can hear me, I assume? Okay, terrific. Okay, so I assume that you can see my screen here. All right, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I too, um, uh, Pace is my alma mater. I graduated there with my master's in information systems. So it's great that I'm in, in good company with many alumni and, and thank you to our other guests as well for joining us today. So I wanted to talk to you today about some of the research that we're doing here, but also to make you aware of the kind of information that is currently being collected about you and in terms of especially with your mobile device, but also some of the open source intelligence tools that we use uh, today as part of investigations. So I have worked um, both on public and private sector investigations, um, and a lot of the research that we do supports all types of initiatives, and I'm going to briefly mention those. So we do have a research lab at the Seidenberg School where we conduct a lot of research in support of local and state and federal law enforcement. So some of the things that we've worked on <clears throat> include dark web investigations. So we have actually provided training, for example, myself and my students to federal law enforcement agents who do these investigations. And you may have heard about the dark web uh, on TV and you know, people stealing your information and selling it there. Well, there are many websites out there that sell everything from illegal weapons uh, to, you know, your frequent flyer miles to credit cards. But most of these dark web sites sell and focus on narcotics. We've also been doing a lot of work, both in class and in the lab, on counter proliferation. Uh, I actually didn't know what this was either until about two years ago. Counterproliferation is the illegal export of goods, whether it's weapons or it's dual use goods like um, aluminium, for example, which you cannot export to North Korea, um, but also different types of proprietary technologies. It's a huge problem in the United States and you know, for example, a gun that somebody would purchase at a gun store here for $500 uh, can be exported to Jordan and sold for about $10,000. So as you can imagine, there's a big incentive for people to engage in this kind of activity. And our students have been working on some of this research and learning about different open source tools that can help in these types of investigations, and then sharing that information with different agencies who work on these investigations. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work on counter-human trafficking investigations. So many dating apps, for example, today um, are used to traffic um, people, um, often teenagers. The average person who becomes involved in human trafficking and forced into prostitution is 13 to 14 years of age. Um, we also have initiatives where we, we push our students to, you know, learn about different types of crimes. And many of my students have gone on to work with different uh, district attorney's offices, as well as law enforcement agencies, and worked on these kinds of cases. Uh, according to the FBI, over 400,000 children go missing in the United States every year. So it's a really, really important initiative for us. We've also done a lot of work in terms of mobile apps used by organized criminal gangs and terrorist groups. I'll just mention a couple of those. And uh, we also do a lot of work on mobile app security. So as we're learning about forensics and pulling data from those phones, we're also learning about how to improve security <clears throat> and viewing security in a very different way from many corporations do. So I'm gonna share some of those findings with you today. So um, there are many apps that are actually being developed by fundamentalist groups like ISIS, for example. Uh, Al Bayan Radio is the most well-recognized radio station that pushes a lot of propaganda for ISIS, Islamic State. Um, and they've actually developed apps to teach children to write and read the Arabic alphabet. They also teach nasheeds, for example. A nasheed is like a song that ISIS warriors listen to um, before they go into battle to, to uh, get them excited, get them energized. And so, you know, ISIS, if you, if you take a look and you follow what's going on, for, for example, Flashpoint provide daily updates. They're still extremely active in Syria and other countries in the Middle East. So here are some screenshots from that ISIS children's app and they actually teach the alphabet uh, using different symbols like swords and guns, which is very disturbing as you can imagine. Um, the other area that we're very interested in and we've done a lot of work on are telegram channels. So there are literally hundreds of different types of uh, telegram channels used by Islamic State. Some of those, um, sh they share different types of documents like uh, how to conduct a lone wolf attack, how to create a good alibi if you're, you're caught, how to build bombs, those kinds of things. And there's literally hundreds that we have categorized and been able to share with people who work on these types of investigations. Um, you probably recently heard about a lot of people who, you know, right-wing activists, you saw some of those on January 6th at the Capitol building, um, and the media reported that, you know, people had been moving, these right-wing extremists have been moving to Telegram. We've actually been looking at Telegram for quite some time and seen about 200 to 300 Telegram channels where these individuals will communicate with one another. This is just a screenshot, for example, of one of their uh, telegram notices, basically publishing the home addresses of some very senior people from the intelligence world. And they've been there for a number of years, so they haven't moved there recently. Um, they are obviously on, on other encrypted chats. For example, um, you've probably heard about Parler. So phones call, come in all shapes and sizes, right? So we have a problem with phones, for example, entering the prison system. Uh, we, you know, there are people who are paid to fly in phones, for example, cell phones uh, at a very high premium via drone. And so there are many drones that have been used to, to get phones into prisoners. But this is kind of one of those ingenious ways to get a phone into a prison today. So some prisoners have actually been caught uh, trying to bring these phones in. I won't uh, go into detail about how they get those phones in, um, but uh, 
we're also dealing with a big problem with encrypted phones, whereby you know, drug dealers at very high levels are using encrypted phones, whereby only one particular phone can be used to connect with another phone. So we have a big problem today, especially across Europe and in the UK with um, EncroChat and encrypted phones um, that are, go well beyond the encryption provided by like a Samsung Galaxy or an iPhone. So mobile intelligence is another area that I've gotten involved with recently. It's a very interesting area because previously I worked in digital forensics whereby we get a phone in and we can do an examination. We can see what the individual was up to. And you can pretty much tell whole person's life story once you have their phone, as you can imagine. And we'll go in more in depth about all the different types of information that a phone is collecting. But mobile intelligence is something different. I haven't heard people talk about it, um, but it's an area that I've you know, grown into because the idea that you can identify what people are talking about or gathering intelligence in real time is really, really important. So there are some agencies, for example, that have run drills on what to do if a shopping mall is taken over by a fundamentalist group, for example, or right-wing group. And so how could you identify where those potential terrorists are located in real time? And so that's kind of the real value behind this. If there's a high profile um, terrorist trial going on outside, you know, you want to know where to deploy your law enforcement, see if any um, terrorists are potentially in the area uh, who are using specific types of mobile apps. So there's lots of practical uses for this, but there's also many privacy concerns, which I also want to share with you. Local Scope is a mobile app that is available for iPhone, and it is a tremendously interesting app because it includes about 12 different mobile apps with geotags. Basically, what this means is every time you upload something on Twitter, for example, or Zomato, or Instagram, or Facebook, a lot of people don't realize that they're also disclosing their location. And what local scope will do is it will allow you to see in real time who is uploading to one of about 12 different mobile apps and how far away that person is. And you can click on a map to see somebody who's a few feet away from you and find out their account information. And so obviously this has tremendous uh, implications for both privacy, but also for intelligence operations. It also includes augmented reality. And what that means is that you can actually take your iPhone and you can pan around a room and you can see who is actually tweeting or um, uploading information to Instagram or, or posting something online in real time and know exactly who that person is, how many feet away they are, and be able to also click on their account to see more information about that individual. Hope I'm not scaring anybody. <laughs> so um, cell phone investigations. So there's lots of different tools that I can use to find out information about different people and who they are. So one of those tools is called Spy Dialer. And what is interesting about this is if you have a phone number, you don't know who's associated with that phone number, you can go on this website, you can enter the phone number and click call, and you can hear the voice associated with the voicemail for that individual. Um, but what's really great about this tool is that it doesn't register as a missed call on the user's device. So they don't know that you've called and listened to the voice on their voicemail. Other ways that we can gather intelligence. Um, there are ways, many ways of spoofing your caller ID. So anybody who's gotten, everybody's gotten those robocalls and you know that very often they will spoof 
different phone numbers for Microsoft, the IRS, who, or whoever they like. One of those tools is Bluff My Call. There's also Spoof Card, for example. So if you have a phone number and you don't know who is associated with that phone number, there's a pretty good chance that most people at some time in their life with that phone, they've called Domino's and ordered a pizza. Domino's has one of the most comprehensive databases of phone name and address information out there. And so if you spoof your caller ID, you call Domino's, what does the person at Domino's do? They say, hello, is this such and such at this address? And suddenly you have a name and address associated with that person. There's lots of other things that we can do. So there, there's, for example, car rentals. Uh, we, there are tools on those websites where you can request a receipt from a, a recent rental. And so we can go online and we can actually pull rental receipts very easily for individuals of interest. If you are an Xfinity customer, you can actually go to this website and you can identify the addresses of customers and their SSID. The SSID is the name of their router at their home. And so this gives us a lot of information about who resides at a particular address and the service that they're using. One of the big sources of information for um, people who work in investigations are PACE sites. So if you haven't heard about PACE sites, uh, it's very important that you do know about them. There's Pastebin, there's Just Pasted, there's Slexi, and many other websites. And basically what people do is they take sensitive information. It could be thousands of credit card numbers. It could be names and addresses. And people just post that information online anonymously. And so for investigators, it's a huge source of information, but also it's a, obviously a huge privacy concern. It is an area that companies are learning about so that they can see if their sensitive corporate data is being posted on there, because we have seen numerous incidents where disgruntled employees um, who have maybe been fired from a company will post sensitive corporate data or other information online. So Twitter is a, has what is called a API that is made available to the public. So without getting too technical, what this means is that you can do a lot of analytics on a person's account if they have a Twitter account. And so one of those tools that is very beneficial is follower.me. And it's one of probably 50 to 100 different Twitter analytics tools. So as long as I have a username associated with a Twitter account, which everybody can gain access to, um, you can identify the owner name when they created that account, but you can also find at their, whether they're basically a happy person, melancholy, based on the type of language that they use in their tweets. But what's helpful for me is that it also tells me the device that they use to tweet. So if somebody's using a Samsung Galaxy or they're using an iPad, it will show up using the follow.me tool. This enables me to know in advance what type of device I may have to investigate in the future. Tinder. So if you're kind of uh, the old, one of the older generations like me, you may not be that familiar with Tinder, but Tinder is a extremely popular dating app um, that many people, millions and millions of people use worldwide. Um, they have a core base of 18 to 24. Uh, their revenue, for example, in 2017 was $1.3 billion. 95% uh, of Tinder users meet their matches within one week. Um, and only 25% of online dating. So people are using mobile apps to date more and more rather than going to a website to find uh, a potential match. Uh, the average male message is 12 characters and 122 characters uh, for women. 
So what is interesting about Tinder? What is interesting about Tinder is when I mentioned about real-time intelligence with mobile applications, Tinder is one of those applications that can give me that real-time intelligence on an individual. If I can get somebody to swipe right on my profile and swiping right means that you like a person and potentially want to meet or connect with that person, uh, then there is an exchange of information. And that exchange of information basically means that on my phone, your Tinder profile has now been saved. I can also gain access to your Spotify profile if that's connected to your Tinder account. And I can now also get a link to your Instagram account and view all your pictures, even if your Instagram account has been marked private. So this is known as deep linking. So the message here is, you'll see many different types of applications today where you can log in with uh, your Google login or your Microsoft login or your Instagram login or your LinkedIn login. And you need to be very careful because basically you are now sharing information across multiple platforms that multiple organizations can gain access to. So it is a privacy concern and many people don't read the fine print or realize that once you log in to, for example, uh, Facebook with an Instagram login, you basically are sharing information with both or Spotify and Instagram. Suddenly those two apps are sharing information. So this is just an example of the information that we can pull. Um, so Basically, you can see on the left column, light. This is when somebody swipes right on a profile. We can see the birth date for that person, and we can see how many feet that person is away from us. We can get the longitude and latitude of where that person is exactly. And um, one of the things that we can pull from Tinder as well is we can pull all of somebody's conversations uh, and everybody they've spoken to, all of their contacts in plain text. So one of the things that often happens in investigations is we may end up creating what's called a sock puppet. And a sock puppet is basically a fake profile that is used to gather intelligence. And there's numerous tools that we can use. So for example, there are disposable email accounts. Um, there are websites that enable you to uh, receive SMS authentication text messages so that you don't have to give a real phone number. Of course, you can use Google Voice to mask your real phone number. So there are many, many different tools that we use. This is a great tool recently introduced. This person does not exist. And if you go to this website, you can actually get a realistic picture of somebody that is actually computer generated. It's a great advantage to law enforcement who had very big problems with creating sock puppets or fake personas because um, you cannot use the picture of somebody who's still alive uh, for your investigation, obviously. Um, so this website creates very, very realistic pictures that are completely ge uh, computer generated uh, that can be used um, for a fake persona. So it could, for example, be used for that fake Tinder profile that you set up um, and to ensure that you can get somebody to swipe on your profile and then gain access to their account information. So iPhone, the iPhone and Android do similar types of tracking, and it's pretty extensive, the amount of information that can be pulled from you. There is one line of code that a developer can add to their mobile app, which is called UI device class. I'm not going to get technical, but basically it allows any app developer to see the assigned name of your phone, the device model, the operating system name and version that you're running, whether you're holding your iPhone landscape or portrait, or whether you're holding it um, in a horizontal or vertical manner, 
and you can find out this information in real time. You can find out uh, battery level and you can determine proximity of the device to the user. So if I am an app developer, I can determine exactly every single time somebody holds that, lifts up that phone and holds it to their ear. So one of the things that discovered over the years of, of doing mobile app analysis <clears throat> is that we can do a lot of, there's a lot of tracking that happens with third parties. So for example, if you're using the Instagram app or using you know, uh, Spotify, you're probably actually connecting to anywhere from 20 to over a hundred different servers across the world. And so you have many third parties that are collecting information about lots of different things that you do on your phone. One of those third party analytics companies that many companies use is UXCAM. And what UXCAM does, it actually does video recordings of how you touch and use the app um, and provides that information back to that analytics company. So it, it does actually video captures of your swipes on your phone and sends those back to the DNS servers. It also records Google map fragments. So this is one of those things, if you use Google maps, for example, a lot of people don't realize that all of those, every time you move or you move closer onto a particular map, all of those screenshots are being captured and being sent out. Here's another one of those uh, analytics companies and many of these have been bought up by Google. Uh, Fabric tracks user sessions lengths, um, knows exactly when you're using the app, captures telephone numbers, and you know, a couple of their customers, for example, are Uber and Viber. TikTok. So you've probably heard a lot about TikTok in the news. Um, based on more than a year of investigating this app, I firmly believe that this is a threat to national security. Um, TikTok, they have their headquarters in Beijing. The app monitors the user location, which is not unusual. They monitor your location based on GPS, Wi-Fi, so your Wi-Fi connections, and also cell sites, so your pr proximity to cell towers. But the app can read your contacts, and it has system-level access to the device, which means it has the ability to install malware in your phone. It also has the ability to view US government applications that are running on your device. The, dev the app has poor encryption, so the data that it stores is unencrypted, which is good news for us because we can see exactly what is being collected. But one of the scariest things, and this is why I believe it is a national security threat, is the fact that it has launcher permissions. So it has full access to your device, your photos, your messages. It can read, when I say reads your messages, so it can capture any of those SMS authentication codes that are sent from your bank, for example. And that is, by the way, is another problem on the fraud side is that we have this thing called SIM swapping where people go in and they report to a phone carrier that their phone has been lost or stolen. They basically get a SIM card that matches your phone number and they gain access to your bank account app by basically getting the bank to send an SMS code an authentication code to that SIM that now mimics your SIM card. So um, they have the TikTok app has the ability to make calls or send messages without your permission. They can install files without your permission and they can surreptitiously activate your camera without your, your knowledge. So do you want, if you have a family, for example, do you want your kids using this type of app? I think one of the concerns is that facial recognition is hugely important in Chinese society. Uh, facial recognition glasses have been used by the police extensively across mainland China, as well as in Hong Kong. It's been used to identify protesters. 
And basically these glasses continually capture uh, the faces of people in crowds and match that in real time to databases in China um, and so that they can make arrests pretty much in real time when they identify somebody who's been flagged in a database as being wanted. Facial recognition is being used uh, in IDs and passports in Hong Kong. And one thing that I found was particularly interesting was that Saffron Identity and, and Security is a company that now works with China and Hong Kong and also works with the US State Department. So how important is facial recognition? There are, and I think this is a very conservative number, 200 million CCTV cameras in China. Um, facial recognition is used to access um, public transportation. And we know the facial recognition has been used to round up Uyghurs um, for what they have called re-education camps uh, from Xinjiang, China. So these, this is a picture, for example, of these facial recognition glasses that the police use in China. And I can tell you that, you know, when you, the idea behind this is that when you enter China as a visitor, they use facial recognition to identify who exactly you are. The other thing is that it is very, very commonplace that they will request your cell phone at the airport and make a full dump of that phone. So if you ever visit China or any other country, consider using some phone that you buy locally or some phone that has no data existing on it already. So Office of Personnel Management or OPM breach didn't make a lot of waves in the news, but it was probably arguably the most uh, extensive breach in the United States. 20 million government employees were compromised. So when I say compromised, think about a government profile, which may include, which will include the names of all your family members, all the countries you visited, all the bank account information that you have, um, maybe the results of polygraph tests, maybe fingerprints, and so all of that information is now in, in the hands of China. So TikTok is similar, has a similar focus to the face app in Russia. Um, do you really want to be using an app that has access to your phone, your contacts, can facially recognize who you are um, and could later be used um, against you or for some type of criminal, um, some kind of criminal activity. Uber is another interesting mobile app that we have examined extensively. And we can basically identify from this app, it's continually monitoring where you are, what your location is, and also stores information about any buildings that you've been in close proximity to. Um, I've redacted some of the information here, but basically this is the type of information that we can pull from the Uber app. All of your credit card information, everywhere you've been, lots of personal information can be gathered just from this one app. You know, for example, if you use the Starbucks app and you enable location services, that app is continually pinging you every few minutes to identify your location. And we can pull all of that location information from your phone. So why was Uber of interest to us? Well, Uber has been doing quite a few shady things that have been reported in the media and from federal and local authorities. So Unroll Me is an app if you're not familiar with it, that basically cleans out your email account of spam. Um, unbeknownst to people who install this app, what it was also doing is it was tracking anybody who had email receipts from Lyft, and then it was forwarding that information to Uber, its competitor. Um, Uber also got into trouble a, a couple of years ago because um, 
And there was a big meeting, high profile meeting between Tim Cook and the CEO of Uber, because after individuals had installed the mobile app, it was still tracking individuals. So there's lots of different cases like that, and we could go on for quite a bit. But one of the things that, a couple of the things that we've noticed from examining the app is that the Uber app continually tracks the user after the Uber ride has ended, longer than it specifies on its website. What was more interesting is that we saw that the Uber app tracks your ride in Lyft cars and also tracks your ride in New York City yellow cabs. So a lot of tracking going on by Uber that goes beyond Uber rides. So we talked a little bit about open intelligence before, and let's talk about this quickly. Situational awareness. If you're wondering what's going on around you, there's many different apps like Twitter, for example, where you can see alerts. Many of those are not uh, very accurate sometimes, but one particular app that's very, very helpful is the Citizen app. It's so helpful that I know that even local law enforcement sometimes use it to see if there is a notification about an incident before they know about it. Um, there's police scanners um, that you can actually use, believe it or not. Uh, there are DOT cameras. And so a lot of people don't realize that you can actually connect with cameras across New York City and view what's going on in real time through those cameras on different streets around the city. So here's an example of the, the New York City Department of Transportation camera down by Pace. And you know it's a real-time streaming video. So you can connect with all of these, these cameras and you can see the locations here on this map. Shodan. Shodan is an extremely interesting app for me because what it allows people to do is it allows people to connect to unsecured IoT devices across the world. So what this means is that you could actually pick any area across the globe and you can actually connect to unsecured cameras. And it's pretty scary because they actually you know, have examples on the website. Right now, cameras that you can connect to in people's homes and watch exactly what they're doing. So a lot of these cameras that we buy at a cheap price are unsecured. They're not updated. They don't have limited or zero updates. And people don't realize that they have a default login and password that should be changed. Be careful the kind of information that you share. I saw that uh, police in Irving, Texas um, provided this notification, which I thought is very, very helpful and you know, relates to the work that I do in open source intelligence. There's lots of ways to find out information about you and maybe you don't realize the type of information that you share. This is a website called OSINT Framework. And OSINT Framework basically shows you hundreds of different tools that you can look at. So you can track aircraft in real time. You can track uh, ships crossing the sea in real time. You can uh, connect to cameras in real time. You can look up usernames associated with an individual, see all of the social media accounts for that person. For basically as much as so for 20 to 50 dollars i can pull down a full credit report on an individual and all of their bank account information any bankruptcies or court appearances that that person has has made it's free or low cost to find out a lot of information about people and this is a lot of the information that we're interested in why is this important is also another aspect to this. And a lot of companies have grown exponentially their threat intelligence department. So with the growth of hacktivists, for example, and other activists, um, 
A lot of companies have invested very heavily in threat intelligence. Photo forensics. Be careful about photos and uploading photos because they're a tremendous source of information. We can pull lots of location information from a photo. So a photo will include the following information. Name of your device, um, aperture, uh, longitude and latitude of where that picture was taken, the type of phone that you used, the make model serial number of that phone or camera that you used. So it's got a tremendous amount of information. We can then take that information, just your, your photo images and map out where you have been throughout the day. Google images you can take any picture, you can upload it to Google images and you can find similar images of that individual across the web. Multigo, Multigo is a free tool that enables us to take any piece of information about an individual. It can be an email address, a phone number, a, a username, plug it in here and it will scan across the web and show us where you appear across the web. I don't even bother using Google as a search engine for this kind of information because there are so many better tools out there. In terms of mobile forensics, I know we're coming towards the end, so I'll be quick. There is a jailbreak exploit out there for iPhone that we can use. And with this jailbreak, we've been able to identify a lot more information that is being collected on your iPhone than we ever realized before, system related information. So here is one of the databases that we can pull. So your phone is continually collecting information based on cell phone towers that you walk past, not connect with, just walk past. And we can easily look up those cell towers to see where you've been throughout the day. Every single time you use an application on your iPhone, the start time and the end time of your use of that application is being stored on your phone. Apple Pattern of Life is a, or Apollo is a tool that basically pulls all of this system information together and can tell us lots of information about what you're doing in terms of, you know, if you're at a particular crime scene at a particular time, what was your heart rate? What was the weather forecast? Uh, when was the last time you used your Apple wallet? Okay, all this type of information can be used as corroborating evidence in an investigation. This is, are some examples of the type of information that the health app um, collects, for example not just the number of steps that you use, but the elevation that you've been at throughout the day, the humidity, uh, the forecast, the, the temperature, the longitude, the latitude, lots of information that we can pull just from the health app on your iPhone. So just a few tips. There are things that you can do to limit the way that you are tracked on your phone. One of those ways, and you have to dig a little bit deep into your iPhone, for example, I'll just use this as an example, is significant locations. Um, and we can pull a lot of information about places that you frequently visited and when you visited those places. If you wanna know, everybody's been compromised at some point through social media or through bank. You can go to this website, have I been pawned, enter your email address, and it will list all of the data breaches that your email address has been compromised in. So I know we're running short on time, so I'll be very quick through this. The future of cybercrime, supply chain. Many app developers today borrow from different online libraries for their mobile apps without realizing that those libraries are sometimes state-sponsored. So could, could have a hand of Russia involved in those. And so we have to be very careful with how we're doing app development today. Managed service providers. These cloud service providers are creating a new avenue and a new access point for people to access thousands of different companies very, very efficiently. State-sponsored attacks will continue. Black energy is malware that uh, didn't make big headlines, but a piece of malware that took out 
the electrical grid for 700,000 people in Ukraine. The concern today for the US government is the potential for, you know, for example, malware to infect the MTA and cause signal disruption in the subway system. It's a real threat. Not Petya, a ransomware attack that cost Merck 1.3 billion. SolarWinds, the largest cyber attack in the United States. So the work that we're doing, I think is really, really important. It's a quick shameless plug for, for my book in case you're interested in learning more about this topic. Um, but love to get you involved. Um, if you have any interest in getting involved with the research, supporting our students and what we do, then that would be terrific. Email me anytime you have questions or if you, again, if you're interested in getting involved, that's my, my contact email address. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. It was very insightful and scary at the same time. Um, we have some time for some questions, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Um, first of all, would you say that these apps and, and data breaches are specific to iPhones or that Samsungs are less vulnerable in that sense? So generally, up until, up until recently, about 95% of malware was on Android. And still the majority of Android, uh, still the majority of malware is found on Android devices. And this is because the Android operating system is open to the public. It's easier to write exploit exploits for those. But Androids have improved in terms of full disk encryption, but there is less oversight in terms of apps that are released. Um, and many updates don't make it to the end user because it's often up to the manufacturer to push, push updates to that device. So iPhones are more secure than Android devices. And is, is this app Insight Data specific to users or, or special security um, experts? So uh, I missed the first part of that. Are you, are you talking about getting access to this type of information that I would yeah. talk about? Yeah. Okay. So so this type of information, there are many free tools out there that you can actually use. So there is a tool called uh, Decipher um, Backup Browser. And so you can basically sync your phone to your computer and you can look a lot at a lot of this information for yourself. There's other free tools out there like Magnet Acquire, which allows you to um, image your phone. It's a free tool out there. So there's many of these things that you can do yourself as well. But examining one app, as I, as I mentioned before, we've spent over a year looking at the TikTok app itself because it's like going down a rabbit hole. You keep finding more and more information. Okay, thank you. And um, what should we do if we've already been scammed or feel like we're potentially getting scammed and how can we prevent this in the future or if, or if it hasn't happened already, how can we prevent this? Sure, um, I would say the longer your password is always gonna be the better. And symbols and spaces throw off um, password cracking software. So I would say make it complex, but include as many symbols as you can or characters. Um, continually change your password, vary it from one site to another take a look at have I been pawned, see if your email address, for example, has been part of a data breach and make sure that you've changed uh, your password since then. So if, for example, LinkedIn is one of those notable breaches. If you have a LinkedIn account, you should change your password. A lot of people pay for monitoring services and uh, you can actually do your own kind of due diligence yourself. I have a credit freeze on with all credit reporting agencies, it's free for you to do, but nobody can open up an account in my name or even make an inquiry into my credit history or my credit report. Uh, so that that is important. Um, so there's lots of things that, that you can do yourself without actually paying for a monitoring service. One scam as well is that I've seen is, if you see a small transaction in your bank account, so it could be nine cents was added to your account and then nine cents was taken away in your bank account. That is somebody who is testing your account 
to see if they can gain access and conduct transactions. And you're bound to see a, a transaction that will be in the thousands after you've seen that type of transaction. So make sure you call your bank right away if something like that happens so that they can freeze your account. Great, thank you. And um, could you share some of your concerns you have with cookies online or um, Google um, self filling out all of your data because they already have it stored? Sure. Uh, so cookies are actually just uh, text files. So they're not malicious, they're not malware, um, but they are used to track where you go on the web. There are a couple of uh, tools that you can add to your browser out there. One of them is Ghostery. Another one is Collusion. And what these tools allow you to do is they allow you to see who's tracking you on a website and you can actually stop those trackers on a website. But it's a little bit annoying at first when you use this, but I can tell you that there are certain websites like, for example, CNN is notorious for tracking you and ESPN is notorious for tracking you. You will have probably over a hundred different trackers tracking everything that you do on that website. It's not unusual for, you know, thousands and thousands of tracking elements to track you on one visit to a website. And just so everybody knows about cookies, there is um, a service out there that basically auctions cookies off on a daily basis. So cookies for millions of Americans, billions of them are actually auctioned off on a daily basis to see to show uh, sell to third party marketing companies. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and are there any cyber security experts that you could recommend to help with home networks and smartphones? Um, sure. So, so there are people who do that because especially because uh, many of us are working from home, you know, more than ever before and working virtually, which creates another problem. So if you talk to people who work at district attorney's offices, they're prosecuting a lot more crime uh, at empty commercial spaces. Commercial space crime has grown exponentially since the pandemic. Um, so there are people who can help you. If, if anybody has any specific questions, feel free to reach out to me and I can give you some general advice and also give you some some suggestions on that. Great, thank you. Uh, we just have time for a few more. Just for a more specific question about Uber and Lyft, are there any legal ramifications for Uber or apps that track for longer periods of time than they should be? So it's a good question. And there have been lawsuits with a number of different companies who do uh, tracking. So the point, the, the whole point about this is what do they say in their privacy policy versus what do they do? Because there's nothing stopping anybody collecting millions of pieces of information about you and selling that information. Um, and there is actually no one privacy law that basically states that you have to have a privacy policy on your website, believe it or not. So because of a lack of privacy legislation at the federal level, a lot more states have implemented their own privacy legislation. New York has been making great strides with Department of Financial Services, uh, Rule 500, for example, uh, for financial institutions and their cybersecurity plan. Uh, the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Protection Act, which uh, protects residents of California from, you know, and gives them more control over their personal data. Um, so there have been investigations by different attorney general's offices, but a lot more needs to be done. Um, and a lot more information is being shared than, than should be shared. Okay. And just to sort of lead on from that, if you block permissions on specific apps on your device, does this prevent the app from then obtaining information or can they develop an override to this block? So limit uh, as many, as many um, permissions as you can. And so the good thing is that Android devices like your Samsung Galaxy 
now enables you to have more uh, control over what kind of access you give. Um, disable your location services as much as you can. Uh, didn't, you know, a lot of apps will ask you if they can connect to Bluetooth devices, do not. A lot of people don't realize that uh, your Bluetooth on your iPhone, for example, can be used to identify where you are in your house. So what room you're actually in, it can be that specific. Um, so that is a new way of identifying even close, more closely where a person is um, in terms of, it's very difficult to stop this type of tracking though. Um, even if you don't connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot, every single time you walk past a router, a Wi-Fi router, that is being recorded on your phone. And it's a big help to investigators, but it's a, a major privacy concern. So there, there's not a lot that you can do in terms of, of tracking. Um, and, you know, it's going to happen anyway, unfortunately. But disabling location services is a good start. Okay, thank you. And what are your opinions on Waze, the, um, the app? Oh, Waze. So oh, I don't. So, okay. So one of the questions before was on Google. I don't use any Google products as much as I can. I do have a Google account, but I use it very, very, I don't connect it with other Google accounts. Um, but Waze, take a look at their privacy policy and all of the information that they collect. It's extraordinary. And just so everybody knows, Waze and these other similar apps, they get that information from basically aggregating phone information from lots of people in your vicinity. And what I mean by that is they look at the average time that it takes from one person to move from connecting to one cell tower to another cell tower. When that duration shortens, it means that the traffic is moving faster. When it lengthens, it means that there's a buildup of people. And so that traffic information is actually a correlation between how quickly you connect from one cell tower to a next, another cell tower along a highway or a road. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and a slightly more specific question to finish. Um, my phone number was stolen um, on the dark web and I'm getting random text messages. What, what do you recommend to do? Uh, try and, and change your, your, your cell phone number um, is one thing, but you have to be careful about accounts that are being connected to that. If somebody has uh, done some SIM swapping or has your phone number is using your phone number, the problem is if you have a mobile banking app on that phone uh, or any type of app that uses SMS authentication codes, for example, or links, that other person may be able to get those links and those codes. Um, so try to change that number if you can. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so just to wrap up, thank you everyone for joining us today. Our next back to class session is on Tuesday, the 16th of March at 6 p.m. with Paige lecturer and internationally known artist, Jane Dixon. Please visit the alumni website for more information about our upcoming virtual sessions. And if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to contact Dr. Dan Hughes. Thank you very much. Great, thank you everybody for joining me today.